Hi, this is Dan Limblade. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce. We're coming to you today from the Broward Center for the Performing Arts, and we're going to talk about multiple pathways to the American dream, and we have several guests with us this afternoon. Um, we're going to be talking with them all about different ways that you can gain access to knowledge and then a, get a job without going into great debt, going to college. And we're going to explore that today for about the next hour. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce our panelists today. We have Heather Havercheck. She's the Chief Operating Officer at Broward Health Medical Center. Heather, good to see you. Uh, Rudy Jayana. Uh, father and husband, business owner, and tile industry leader. Rudy, good to see you. Michael Goldstein, he's the son, husband, father, grandfather, president, and CEO of LAN Infotech. He loves technology. He's also the cyber provider for the Florida Panthers. Go Panthers! Yes, and last but certainly not least, we have Denise Mendez, daughter, wife, mother, potter, principal engineer in, at Microsoft, and she likes to break things and fix them. So we'll be exploring a little bit of that with her today as well. And we've asked our audience if they have any questions during the process to please uh, formulate those, and then at the end we'll be opening it up to them if they want to ask a question. So let's start it out with Heather. Um, we'll, we're going to move through these questions with each of you. Some have been tailored to you, some not. So if any of the panelists you have um, one of the questions that you want to expound on or if you want to talk about uh, a different line of thought, please just uh, go right in and please share the mics with each other as well. So Heather, we know healthcare since the pandemic had problems getting nurses with traveling nurses and whatnot. Uh, we know you guys have many open positions at all of the hospitals and in the medical field. Why might a student who is not interested in medicine initially want to give healthcare a second look? So thank you, Dan, um, and thank you for having us here today just to share a little bit um, about what these pathways can look like. So, you know, I think the pandemic forever changed the healthcare culture, right? Um, it wasn't just nurses that were difficult to find. It was respiratory therapists. It's been the folks that work in some of our imaging areas that take different pictures when patients are in the hospital. But I would encourage people, even if you think you don't want to do healthcare initially, there's so many different facets inside the hospital that make the hospital run. Um, so we have different programs where you could come in maybe and work in something like patient access, where you're doing the whole intake for patients, learning about insurance, being that first face that someone sees when they come in the hospital. Maybe you want to work in another area that's kind of behind the scenes. We have all different financial positions where you learn about healthcare finance, we have teams that help in our nutritional services and catering that are super important to what we do. We also have other departments um, such as facilities that really help do all the building, the design, and the construction. And there's a lot of these jobs that are actually at entry level. So if you're unsure what you want to do, I would encourage you to try some of those roles. And as you get into the hospital, you might find that there's something that really attracts you. And we do have really strong tuition reimbursement. So if putting up dollars ahead of time are challenging to pay for tuition, we have different programs that can help offset that and support you as you want to kind of grow in your career. And then there's, with being part of a large health system, Broward Health, you know, we have about 14,000 employees, but we have multiple locations around the community. So there's a lot of different levels you can continue to accelerate at. I will tell you personally for me, I started there as a registered nurse at the bedside and now I'm the chief executive officer. So it's been quite a journey. Um, they helped put me through graduate school, but it, it's just a great journey. And I think sometimes when people think they don't want to do healthcare, it's because they don't actually understand all the things that go into making healthcare in a hospital. So what I would just encourage people to find something that fits for them. 
I hope that answered the question. It certainly did. You know, a lot of people, whenever they think of healthcare, they just think of doctors and nurses, surgeons and emergency personnel. So it, it, it's a business. You have front office, back office, and everything in between. So it, great answer, and thank you for that. Rudy, let's talk uh, to you about um, apprenticeship uh, and what kind of experience uh, you can acquire in your industry, which is tiles, uh, and how that could translate to eventually starting your own business. Absolutely. So in, in our business and in tile industry, it's uh, part of the construction industry. And so uh, I myself had started a as a tile apprentice, young, and then uh, grew into the tile contractor uh, at a very young age. I was uh, 18 when I started to work as an apprentice and I was already running a business with two crews at 22. So you're able to go into uh, business right away. Uh, in our industry also we have um, the uh, like the ABC Institute College which uh, provides uh, apprenticeship for different trades which whether it's HVAC, whether it's plumbers, uh, linemen, electricians, and uh, there's a four-year program that contractors uh, would sponsor you and basically bring you in as an apprentice, and you can work while you and, and earn while you learn. And so, when you graduated four years, you have no debt, and you're able to uh, get a very high-paying job. Uh, I know that right now linemen make a you know very good amount of money and they're in high demand. So construction today, uh, there's probably uh, 500 plus, 500,000 plus jobs needed in the US right now for tradesmen. And uh, that is something that uh, I feel right now in, in our industry, we need to uh, be able to communicate what is available out there for our youth. Because uh, sometimes the only thing that they know, or that they hear is about college, and college is, is needed. Uh, in a lot of roles, but in many roles that I've seen uh, in, in our industry, uh, college is not um, uh, needed. You know, we have tradesmen that have learned on the job like myself, and today we do a lot of training for uh, apprenticeships that work with contractors, and we help them learn the tile industry. There's a lot of new technology that is being used to create large format tiles that are five foot by 10 foot. It requires a skilled labor, somebody of, that knows the technical aspects of how to install that product. So we find that today there's a lot of um, need for the education in our industry specifically and in the trades as well. Let me, let me just ask a follow-up question to that because I remember way back when I was a young guy and I was looking for summer work uh, something that I could apply to my future endeavors. Uh, how would uh, a young person, a student, find these types of opportunities right now? Well, as I mentioned before, the, um, the ABC Institute College um, is uh, one of the places that I find is um, a great place to start. They can guide you as far as uh, what is it that you would uh, like your interest be, because uh, th there's a lot of hands-on uh, trades work there, and you can uh, see if you're gonna go into the um, ele electrical side, if you wanna go into the lineman side, uh, you know, you'd have to be comfortable with heights to work the power lines. Um, you also have HVAC, which, which is, uh, you know, needed a lot here in Florida with the air conditioning. And so um, what I've found is there's a lot of apprenticeship programs out there. The ABC I happen to be on the board of and um, has a very good program with local contractors. And the construction community is just um, a great community to start. And as you mentioned, um, you can start you know anywhere on a construction job you know, just by taking some OSHA safety classes and you can start just to see and get a feel for it and work on a job site. There's many uh, areas also that are not just um, in the field, hands-on. There's back office, 
uh, jobs that you can start also. And construction companies are always looking for somebody who you know wants to start, even if it's in their office, and they will train you on the job. So there's a lot of a lot of work even in the office, and now with the um, the technologies and how they're using the different technologies to manage the projects, you can also uh, study with a construction company and learn the technology to be able to run the software. Yeah, we also have uh, Sheridan and McFadder technical colleges where you can learn trades and auto mechanics and, and transportation logistics and all of that. So those are good options, as well as Broward College as well, for two-year certificate programs and whatnot that you can get associate's degree and not have to go into great debt. They also have Pell Grants that are available uh, at no cost uh, to, to the user. So those are lots of different options. I remember uh, one of my best friends, he was a carpenter type. He liked to use his hands. I was no good at that kind of stuff. But he went to a job site and actually just walked up and said, hey, I'm looking for work. He started out as a day laborer, just carrying buckets and things, and then that eventually worked into his uh, avocation right now, which is all the way up to owning his own business. So it started out that way, though, and it's a great story. Uh, he's actually over at Sanibel Captiva right now, uh, reconstructing that island because it was just devastated from that hurricane. So there's a lot of work over there right now. But thank you so much, Rudy, for, for your comments. I appreciate that. Michael Coldstein, Land Infotech. I've been hearing so much about <laughs> artificial intelligence lately, AI. Are, are employers wanting new employees, fresh young employees to be AI literate? Are they expected them to be ready to go on all of the nuances of AI? Fill us in. So AI has definitely been around a long time. It's just been publicly uh, in the news consistently over the past six months. So things like ChatGPT, BARD, uh, Microsoft has a big offering out there called Copilot. But yes, I think that it's one of those buzzwords technologies. I will say just to uh, digress, digress a little, I, I went to a four-year college that I came out with an economics degree. And then I am a self-educated IT person for 30 plus years. So I think that a rounded knowledge is definitely needed out there. The understanding of today's buzzwords and understanding you know, what AI is. And just realizing that we've been using AI for years. You, know, you go into that Amazon cart and you put something in there, you leave it there. Kind of funny that you know maybe a half hour later you get a reminder that you have that in the cart. And it's not just Amazon. So these things of AI have been there. You go to uh, help on a website and you're chatting and only realize that it's a chat bot using, using some artificial intelligence. And these are just a lot of examples that, we, that, you, that you could see that's publicly out there. Um, we're a small IT company, we're 24 people. You know, I grew this from you know, two people out there. And you know, we, we always recommend, and we talk at a lot of events like this, is trying to find, as the others have said at this point, looking for an internship to find out what part of the field you might like. You know, it could be AI, it could be help desk, cybersecurity, it could be, as Denise will talk about, VR and, and AR and those type of things that are there. But some basic knowledge is, is needed and a lot of hands-on. I remember when I started looking for IT jobs, it was that I had to have some experience and I wish that I had the opportunities that are out there with McFadden, with Broward Community College. There's a lot of programs that are in place. We've taken a lot of apprenticeships. We're in the midst of working out an apprenticeship now with Broward, Broward College, where we'll have two people that we'll, we'll commit to for a year, and they'll commit to us for a year. And we're going to show them the technology of running a help desk, running an IT services company. So you know, the four-year college doesn't, doesn't, isn't what we look for. We look for somebody that constantly wants to learn. Because today it's AI. Tomorrow it could be another acronym that's out there. I remember that. you know. I did things called DOS, I did things called Windows, <laughs> I did things in there. But realizing that the IT industry is very cyclical, meaning that what was yesterday will come back as a new term. I was doing cloud 30 years ago with a $40 million IBM mainframe, and we were renting time out for people to actually connect up to it. That was the cloud 30 plus years ago, and now it's a, a given piece that's there. You know, writing code. I used to write code all the time. 
So for us, and I think, you know, I know Denise will probably talk about the same piece. You always have to be willing to learn in the IT industry. And if you're that type of person, you know, look for the different fields that are out there, but catch those buzzwords. I always sit there and I, I, I probably in the past three weeks couldn't, couldn't turn on a news station without them using the words AI. It's all over the place. You have to develop your own field, and I, I, I urge people to look for a lot of the programs and find what you like. Look for employers that have great opportunity. You know, you, you had mentioned about IT. The hospitals couldn't run without IT. The tile business couldn't run without CAD software and things along those lines, inventory software. You know, Microsoft couldn't be Microsoft without coders, billing people. So get around knowledge out there. Try it out. Internships are a great way. We have been partakers of that for probably the past 10 years because I have a lot of knowledge that I'd like to pass through to people. And, I, and I'll close it with saying that I have my two sons that work for me. It wasn't just the, hey, come and work for dad. I had a need. My, my middle son was a, a graduate of University of Florida with his master's in business. I needed somebody to run my back end. My, my older son went to school, thought he would be going out there and being a sports marketer. He loved the IT industry, was very happy, does all of our purchasing, all of our renewals, a lot of our, our networking out there. So just to show you how things change, try it, look out for that thing, but always remember, you know, you have to know your stuff because uh, you, 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 can't, you can't talk your way into things, but understand those things. And you have to be honest in those interviews and honest of, of we, we look for personality, we look for somebody that really loves and wants to be in tech. Thank you, Michael, so much for that. I want to share with our listeners, too, that there are some summer programs coming up, one through Career Source Broward, where they'll be placing young professionals, uh, students, if you will, uh, at employers uh, that are requesting for these uh, students uh, and especially uh, areas. Could be communications, accounting, could be a variety of different areas. And then at the chamber that I run, a Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce, we'll be having a couple of students working in a variety of areas so they cross uh, pollinate throughout the organization and get a little bit of everything. It's not a job where you go get coffee for me or you make copies. It's actually looking and copy editing. It's looking at numbers. It's uh, taking spreadsheets and making sure they make sense, putting our financial statement together with our accounting department and all of that. The other one is a new program. Well, I'll say it's a renew program uh, through the Broward Schools, and it is called now Talent Forge. Talent Forge will be launching, and that is also a summer internship program that will couple uh, students uh, aging out of school and, and those in school up to 23 with employers in Broward County. Uh, this is part of the business community's uh, real uh, desire to help build our next generation of business leaders here in, in Broward County and greater Fort Lauderdale. So I'm looking forward to that. Just wanted to give that a plug. Denise, let's get to you because I love that you like to break things and then fix them, because I break things, but I can never fix them, so I, I'm really envious of that. But why is, in your mind, as it relates to the edge of technology, why is failing good? So I think um, <clears throat> as quickly as technology moves, having this adaptability to, number one, learn, number one, feel the kind of, like, when you're learning something new, it's like, I am such an idiot. I, I can't believe, I don't get this. I must be the stupidest person on the planet. 25 years in industry, I got hired by Microsoft, okay? And I kept thinking, any day now, Microsoft is gonna fire me. Like, any day now, I'm gonna get fired. They're gonna realize, like, they didn't hire, like, the caliber of person that they expected at Microsoft. And, like, at least once a month, my boss tells me, Denise, you're crazy, you're amazing, we love you here, like, you're doing awesome. If this is you failing, man, I can't wait to see you thriving. And, and a lot of it has to do with, um, there's like, I call, you know, I call it the, you know, you've heard of the imposter, like the little, like little game kids play, but there's a thing with, called imposter syndrome, um, that there's someone that sits on your shoulder and tells you all the time how, how dumb you are, how you don't get it, right? And that person, 25 years in industry, still sits on my shoulder and often tells me that. And what I love about working at the edge of technology is that nobody knows what the hell they're doing. 
And so I feel like I'm there with other people who don't know what the hell they're doing. So I'm in good company. So it's like, no one's ever built this before. Nobody knows how to do this. Nobody's figured this out. Um, so I'm in good company with my little imposter telling me that, that I'm not that great. Um, one of the way that you can, like a way that you can exercise this today is a lot of schools, colleges and universities, even high schools have hackathons. And you might not think a hackathon is for you, but a hackathon is really just a fancy place, a fancy term, or you know, a scary term for some people, for you to just go and learn something new. Go meet a bunch of people in technology, m meet a bunch of people and try to build a project, try to do a thing, go to a website, take a YouTube tutorial, and try to do something with that. Being at hackathons teaches you how to fail fast, how to learn on your on your toes, which is super important in this day and age. Uh, as technology continues to unravel itself and continues to perpetuate and change quickly and dynamically, jobs will continue to evolve. So, you know, being failing fast, feeling comfortable with failure because you're always going to be failing a little bit, um, but you're failing forward. I, a friend Tangy says all the time, I like to fail, but I fail forward. Every single time I fail, I learn from that failure and I do something else differently the next time. Uh, so having that adaptability, you can exercise that at hackathons. Uh, at, at colleges and universities where, where they also have hackathons, they invite the public to be a participant in those events as well. Um, there's one more point I wanted to make here. And uh, with, since technology shifts and work and the evolution of work continues to change, what, you know, I think Michael was talking about DOS from like 20 years ago. I used to play with DOS. I used to play with the Unix and, you know, the cloud was somebody else's computer. You were just attached to a mainframe. The terminology evolves, but being always learning, being willing to learn is something that the, the one of the things that I got out of college, like I, I have an electrical engineering degree uh, from the University of Florida from way back in the day. I saw myself as an FPL engineer. I don't know why. Never did anything with it. But the one thing I learned in college was how to continue learning. I left college with a toolkit that taught me that every problem can be broken down and I can just figure it out and learn it. Um, it's just a fancy place for you to learn a bunch of stuff and know that you can continue to teach yourself this stuff going forward. Denise, don't pass the mic because I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. Can you think of an example of your failure that was particularly appropriate to this audience where you did fail and what you learned from it? OK. So I worked at Motorola for 15 years. Uh, and I knew everybody in that company. And they shut down the facilities on University and Sunrise. And I had one philosophy, which was work hard, do your work, work hard, and you will move ahead, kind of, because that's kind of what school teaches you. You study, you get an A on the test, and you get to the next grade. You get good grades, you get to a good college. You get to a good college, you get a good job. So you get to a good job, and it's not really the way the world works. It's not about how good your grades are. It's also about your network and the people that you know. So come Motorola shutting down, a bunch of the people that um, worked that I worked with got hired at a company called Magic Leap. And I'm like, oh my God, like I know everybody who works there. I'm going to get a job like that. And it turned out I didn't get a job through the people that I had been working with for the fa past 15 years. Um, they didn't hire me for the roles that they had open. And it hurt like hell. I'm like, oh my God, I'm a failure. Am I like the worst employee? Nobody wants to hire me. I ended up getting to Magic Leap through a soft contact that I had in a team I had never worked with in my life, which was software testing and automation. I'd always worked in manufacturing. Now, like 15 years later, I have to completely pivot careers. And it was great, because I, I knew I wanted to work at this company. Um, and what I learned through that process, which you know, what I thought was a failure, was I never grew my network. I never connected with people. Like I would not go to the to the after work things. I was just like work, 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 work. Um, and that's how you get ahead. And I realized like I needed to change and pivot. So 
I, I swore when I joined Magic Leap, I was gonna be a completely, the different Denise. The Denise who would have said no to the things is the Denise who would say yes to the things at, the, at Magic Leap. So I built, I built an Andro like a Arduino lunch and learn where we would build robots during the lunchtime. I built an employee resource group for women. I got a bunch of women to go to the Grace Hopper conference and built basically what was called the diversity, equity, and inclusion program at Magic Leap just because I was doing that to grow my network. So now come the pandemic and I get laid off at the beginning of the pandemic and now it's like March of 2020 and it's like, oh my God, how am I gonna get a job? And I had built such a network that within a week I had a job at Microsoft because people who knew me knew people at Microsoft and through a soft contact, I met my future boss who's there now. So what felt like a failure, which was the first 15 years of my career and lack of a network, I learned from that, I built a network at Magic Leap and I continue to grow my network like I am here today by growing my network and connecting uh, through somebody I knew. I got connected with Tobin and you know I'm part of this panel today. So continuing to do the things to expand my network um, as a, because you never know when your next job's gonna come from. It's today, it's not, you know, it's really hard to get a job through the traditional paths. Like you can't just apply to a website and submit your resume and you're gonna get a job at a tech company. Uh, they have, I think Magic Leap told me they had 80,000 submissions per month on their web portal. Wow. There is no way a recruiter can screen through, no, no hiring manager can screen through so many resumes. So what ends up happening is a lot of the jobs are through the network and the people that you meet. Obviously, everybody knows that Michael's looking for interns. So you should all should hit him up um, after this right now because you do, you being here and listening to this conversation, you're learning about what other industry professionals are doing and all the all the all the things that you're talking about, Dan, with the uh, the workforce and the uh, the different opportunities for the summer. So it's through going to these events and learning about the community and what people are doing is where you're likely to land your first role or your next role. Yeah, and, that, and that's the important theme there that I pick out, and a great story. Thank you for opening up and being vulnerable with us, but it was about uh, really just getting outside of your hula hoop, outside of your comfort area, and that's the important thing when you're looking for a job, even when you're in a job, you have to constantly be learning, expanding your knowledge base, going to places that feel uncomfortable, because feeling uncomfortable is going to, to educate you and make you that much of a better individual and a better employee. I'm wondering if the rest of our panel has anything that they'd like to add, a failure that they might have had where they learned uh, something that helped them in their career. Does anything come to mind, panelists? Grab a mic. So early in my career, like you, I was wondering, why do they keep hiring me? And I had a recruiter call me, asked me, I was living in New York City, and asked me to go out and interview for a job for a large power company. And when I asked for the requirements, he says, don't worry about it, you'll be able to talk your way through it. So I'm in the middle of this interview that was no more than four and a half minutes. Because a few minutes into it, the interviewer realized I didn't know what I was talking about, and I realized I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> when the, abruptly inter uh, the interview abruptly ended, I walked out in the hall, and in, on my way back to my job, I never felt so small, and I realized that I will never take an interview and try to BS the the, the guy that's up there, because they know more than we all know at that point. But I just felt so corrupted because I listened to the recruiter, I went out on something I should have never gone to, and it changed my whole outlook on things. And that's why when we interview people, we, we still give people a handwritten test, that's right, handwritten with a paper and pen. We ask some of those typical questions that are out there, because I want to see that someone can communicate to go through this and can portray the because we are in support. I think a lot of us have to service customers that are out there, but it changed my career and it was probably my second job. So I worked for a company for three and a half years and it was a large TV network that was there and I felt like I wasn't being appreciated and I got talked into something that I shouldn't have. It was the worst feeling personally. Thank you, Michael. Yes, I think <clears throat> for me it was more about uh, 
when I was young, even though I, I was able to open up a tile contracting business very young and gain a lot of experience in business very young, I've had the opportunity of working uh, with a CPA as an accounting clerk at a distribution center that I worked at when I was doing warehouse work and I would get put into the office because they didn't have the office staff. And so there was a lot of things going on that would give me the experience that I needed to get to the next level. So running my installation company, and even though I was doing well and for, at a young age, I always had this thing where I didn't go to college, I didn't graduate college, so my, I feel that my failure was that I was always looking at that as a negative and sometimes it did put a fear in me, you know, if, if I'm going to go quote the job for the attorney, is it going to look down on me because I'm just a contractor? And so one day, I um, had a very good friend of mine that was a civil engineer, uh, same age, and his dad and my dad uh, did business together as a, my dad as a supplier um, for tile and he, him as a contractor. And we were talking, and, and I shared this with him in confidence, and he said, Rudy, I mean, I would have never known that you didn't go to college. I could have sworn you went to college. I mean, the way you run your business and the way that you um, uh, work with your clients. And so I think the failure was to think that that was, you know, something less. And I found that, you know, being today, you know, an employer of, you know, 65 uh, employees for brick and mortar, you know, and, and, and being a leader in the industry, and, and not just myself, our organization uh, is dedicated to training and creating workshops for our community so that even competitors of mine, other distributors, and uh, tile contractors can learn the right way to install tiles. So I see that today, and I look back in the rearview mirror, and I say, that was a big failure to think that that was, you know, something that I should have put behind me right away and looked at what I was doing and how the success was pushing me forward, and that was what was important. Great. Heather, I, I sense you have a, sure, a story to share as well. Sure, I always have something to say. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that that point that was made about really expanding and building your network is so important. And I think that's one thing for me early on. I wish I would have understood the importance of that because I'm another person. Um, I grew up, my dad was blue collar. He was a mechanic. I just knew that he worked, worked, worked to help provide for our family. And that's always kind of been what's instilled in me, just work, work, work. And I would decline those um, events very often and it was later in my career that I realized how important those people are how those moments are and those connections and then I think just to piggyback off of Dan's comment you know I, I think my career trajectory has been a little different you know I started as a staff nurse at the bedside and I've literally been able to work in probably every different role within the organization but I always encourage you to do what's hard and what's not comfortable because those are the moments when you're unsure of yourself where you don't have the confidence. You're thinking, how the hell did I get here? Am I sure I should be the person here? You think you're gonna fail? That's not where you're gonna fail. You are gonna have some failures along the way, but that's where the success comes and that's where the growth comes. So um, at Broward Health, we have so many opportunities. We have a summer internship program. We have ways you can volunteer in high school and when you're in college or after college or if you, you don't go to college. Um, and it's just important to make those connections and have those experiences so that you can really have a more well-rounded um, portfolio I would say, and I just think it's important because you meet people along that journey as well. Uh, talking about opportunities and volunteering, you know, volunteering at a hospital, but you can also volunteer at nonprofits. Yeah. Nonprofits are always looking either for educators, if you want to try your hand at IT and you know a little bit, a thing or two of computers. I know lots of nonprofits that, you know, would just happy to have people help out building a website, doing impromptu things. So you, it's another way to just try on different hats and see which hat is comfortable for you. Just wanted to add that. Um, you remind me of uh, the volunteering. Thanks, Denise. So if the panelists can all think about this question, and it's something I've thought about um, when I look back on my um, life, trying to figure out when I was a kid what I wanted to be. And some of it 
you know, typical stuff, policemen, firemen. I wanted to be a pro baseball player because I was really into baseball. And, uh, you know, those um, are great ways to go, but they weren't very realistic for me with my skill set. So how, do, how would you recommend a uh, young professional, young uh, student, uh, go about identifying their path? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I can start. I, I didn't know what I want to be when I grew up. Uh, I, uh, but I did know I love reading. I, I really like math a lot. And uh, I like science. I kind of like I'm at everything. I like a little bit of everything. So I'm like, I'm just going to, maybe I'll be a teacher. Uh, my dad is actually an electrical engineer. And he said, you know, Denise, most Fortune 500 companies are run by CEOs that are electrical engineers. And I'm like, all right, I'll do that. Because I didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up. But, uh, you know, part of it is identifying, go back to your past history, right? Because your, your past can help you identify the things that you like. You know, what was your favorite class in school? And, you know, and based on that class, go to the teacher. Hey, what are professions in this field? Or, you know, what kind of things will take me in the direction that this class was taking me in? And, and sometimes it's not necessarily the class. That's the other thing. It might be the professor that you really liked and that you liked the way. And they taught your love language when it comes to learning. Because I know not all professors are, you know, there are there are subjects I struggled with in school that I thought I was stupid, and it was like, no, 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 it was a professor. My first year in college, funny story, I almost failed the circuits class, and I was like, I I'm never going to be an electrical engineer. I can't I can't pass this class. I got two Fs. I couldn't drop the class. My professor got into a, an unfortunate or fortunate accident with a base in a basketball game and a pencil, and he was gone for the other half of the semester. And this other professor, Dr. Negroshell, came in, and he spoke my love language when it came to education. He wrote everything down step by step on the board. And I'm like, oh my god, I actually get this. Uh, and uh, you know, it, uh, in, I ended up with like the two Fs and the two As, and I ended up with a C. So I got through circuits. Um, but you know, sometimes like identify professors that have had an impact in your life if you've had if you've had the luck or privileges to find one and you know what is and ask yourself what is it about them that or what is it was it the topic was it the subject which is what was the class that you left and you're like oh I'm gonna google that when I get home because I found that really interesting you know and kind of use that as your little rabbit hole it's not easy to discover you know trying new things like volunteering is a way to do it but you know also going back to your past experience when did you have the most fun and it cannot be consuming YouTube videos or TikToking. Although that's fun, that's a lot of work. I don't know if you've ever talked to social media influencers, but those people never stop working. And it looks fun, and it looks pretty, and it's 30 seconds of video that you get to see, but it's like 500 hours of video editing, and technology, and software, and marketing, and advertising, and all these other skills that you learn in order to get to the stage where those social media influencers, and data science, believe it or not, lots of data science, understanding your audience and demographics. Great, great. Others? I, I guess I would say don't put so much pressure on yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's absolutely essential that you need to know right away what you want to do. I will tell you when I graduated high school, I was in school to be an elementary ed teacher. I would have been a terrible elementary ed teacher. I thought that's what I wanted to do because I nannied in high school. Um, but I quickly found out, and it happened unfortunately just through a personal experience with my mom's cancer, that I loved healthcare. So getting to be with her at her hospital appointments, I quickly learned that elementary ed wasn't for me. But I think you do have to kind of understand whether it's school or a trade you pick, what, what, do you, what draws to you? Like what are you passionate about? And really try to harness that. And if you are gonna go to college, don't be so stressed out. Take some courses, see what works, see what you kind of like, and it's all going to come to you. And it's OK if you pick something and you have to change later. That happens, and it typically takes you down the right pathway when you find that thing that clicks. You know what? That's a, that's a good point. Because I was going to be the next great investigative reporter. 
<laughs> and, and when I was the edit that, editor of my college newspaper, I thought that was where I was going to go. And then when I got out into the real world, all my great story ideas were given to the senior reporters, and I was stuck at the copy desk. And so I said, forget this. And that's when I pivoted. My uh, roommate at the time worked for the Associated Press, and she said, Dan, the realtors are looking for uh, a new vice president of communications. You'd be really good at that. And so I went to interview, and that was the beginning of my association and organization management career, which I'm still in today. Yeah. So all that writing helped me out in what I do today. So we had some other folks I know on the mic. I was just going to add one more thing yeah. on the on Heather's point about colleges. Okay, there's colleges and there's universities, and I, to be honest, I didn't understand what the difference was for a lot, very long time. I think I just recently learned in the last three years. Colleges are two-year institutions, and they're really cheap, relatively cheap for the quality of education you get. Just go to college. You don't have to. You don't have to go to Harvard. You don't have to do Harvard your for all four years. You could do Harvard your last two years if you want to do Harvard or MIT or whatever it is, or you want to go to University of Florida. You don't have to go all four years. It's more expensive. Go to schools locally. <laughs> you know, you save a lot of money. You know, when you can live at home and somebody else does your laundry for you <laughs> sometimes, and uh, and and you get fully fed meals rather than going and rooming and boarding. That's where colleges and universities you know, get really expensive is when you go out of state, when you go room and board somewhere else, you can explore a lot locally before you finally decide and say, hey, this is the path I want to take. If, if education is, you know, a four-year degree is something that you see in your future, you don't have to go straight to, you know, I have to have all four years at X, Y, and Z college because my dad or mother, sister, brother went there. Um, you can do your first two years locally. I did my first two years at FIU so I could stay home, be with my parents, and then I did my second two years at UF where I got my electrical engineering degree. Thank you, Denise. Michael, did you have something you wanted to add? So, uh, yeah. So like you, Dan, I, I had high hopes. I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s and loved NASA. I wrote letters to every one of the every one of the space centers. I got pictures, and I had these high hopes of being an astronaut. But uh, obviously, that wasn't in my blood. But I realized that it was technology over time. And similar to Denise's story, when I when I went to college, you know, computers were new, and I was a computer major. I will say that I took seven semesters of calculus and didn't know what I would do with it. But in my sophomore year. I failed my first class ever. It was a programming class, and 70% of my grade was the final exam. Now, I got a piece of paper that said you had to solve this problem, and I went from A to Z and I solved the problem, but the professor didn't like the way I solved that problem, and when I got that big fat F, it was devastating to me. I learned that I can go back and petition and argue my case, and they actually had me type up this whole program put it into the computer to prove that it would work. And I went from that F to a C. But after that, I realized that computers weren't for me. And I, my junior year, I ran into a professor that just hooked with me, and it was just perfect. It was called econometrics, and it was using technology to solve business problems and changed my whole life. So you're 100% right, Denise. Sometimes it's the professor that goes out there. I graduated college, couldn't find a job, but I took my first job at New York Life Insurance. And lo and behold, you know, just learned business computing and programming. But you know, that one professor, I could still think in the programming language was called Pascal. And every time I hear that name, it just turns my stomach. And it was just a bad experience for me. But you know, try. There's nothing wrong with failing. I will tell you that one of the classes, I learned to play racquetball in my four-year college that was out there. I learned about art history. I learned a lot of calculus and a lot of programming pieces. But, and then lastly, I just did want to comment, your network is everything. I kind of say that you, know, you look at you know, politics, you look at anyone that's out there, you know, that spokesperson is, is surrounded by an amazing team. And I'm sure you couldn't do your job, I couldn't do my job without an amazing team. And I grow my network here, and that's why, you know, for eight years, been a proud member of the chamber, attend all our events. We do a lot of volunteer work out in the community. It makes you feel good, it makes you look good out there, and it really gives you opportunity to meet people that you might never have met, just like on this panel. I would say what, what I found is most important, and uh, I didn't have to make those college decisions, although I did go to Miami-Dade for 18 months and found that I was torturing myself. <laughs> At an, as an older um, father of two, 
again, trying to improve myself, but I found that I can, I can learn other ways. One of the things that I found early on and what I would recommend is just do it. Whatever it is, do the research and do it. What happens is sometimes you can overthink it, overanalyze it, overstudy it, and then you look back and a few weeks have gone by, months have gone by, and you haven't done anything. I would say do the research, try something. There's so many opportunities today. The market is so good for employees today. And we all you know, are looking for good people uh, to employ, good people to start. You know, we, we at our company, at DMB Tile, we love to start somebody fresh. I've had sales reps that start in the industry and you can't get all the old habits kicked out of them. They are no good for our business. And most of the time, you know, I've hired uh, IT help desk uh, guys that were trapped at a desk that were so much of a networking people person, and they became a great sales rep, great, you know, network, network person at our company. And today they work for the Mohawk Group. They're actually a VP uh, for, a, for a, a region today. So they came, what I call is the DMB Tal University, because we, we like to train and coach you to, um, you know, to better yourself always. And if you've done that and you've been able to go on to an organization like Mohawk and be able to do what, what this gentleman's doing, uh, I'm very proud of that. We have a lot of stories like that. Uh, but one thing that I can say is um, definitely just do it. Don't, don't think about it that much, because you can, pa you can stop your progress. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. I was thinking about, um, we've talked about internships. Uh, I'm mentoring two young uh, men right now. Uh, one lives up in Orlando and one is down here in South Florida. And they, they all are struggling to find their career path. They know what they want to do, but they can't really find the step out and they don't have the network, which we've been talking about, to really um, approach the people. Uh, so I've, I've been helping one who wants to get, he wants to be a professional sports agent. Uh, so I'm introducing him to uh, like the CEO of the Orange Bowl and the CEO of the Panthers and those types of things that he wouldn't be able to approach on his own. And whether or not he, he gets any job in either of those two organizations, he's getting a chance to talk to somebody at the upper levels, which he probably wouldn't get a chance to. So for our listeners and viewers out there, I want to encourage you to try to find a mentor, whether it's at synagogue or at church or wherever, wherever your path leads you, with your parents, your parents' friends, cousins, whatever it is, or um, go to the Chamber of Commerce and see if you can find someone there. Uh, and, and that will be really helpful in, in opening doors for you. So at that level that we've been talking about, our networks, we can also bring it to our students as well. Um, let's talk just a little bit. We have just a little time left. And I think as we, we go through, I want to have uh, each of you kind of formulate uh, some of your final thoughts. And if you had to give our viewers some uh, things that haven't been talked about that you may have been thinking about, why don't you share those with us now and, and at least from your perspective, uh, give kind of a final send off to our viewers. For me, I would say that the, the importance of not only just finding what it is that you like to do is to continue to look for the growth you know, forward if that's what you choose. Because some people in my organization, they enjoy doing what they do to the max. So if I have a warehouse employee that uh, rides a forklift and he does that day in and day out, he loves to do that the best. And he loves to make sure that he does it safely and that he also teaches people around him to be safe and to do it the best. So I would say that whatever you do, you know, make sure that you're always looking to progress if you're looking to do that. Um, to grow and to make sure that um, you're always educating yourself, always learning. Even if, for that forklift driver example, um, he's also a good father. So he's always learning to be a better father. He's always uh, looking for ways to you know, be, be a, uh, a better husband. So I say that um, learning is something that will never end. I think it will end when they throw dirt on you and you don't see the light anymore. 
I, I, I like a, what Rudy said earlier, just do it. I mean, there, you don't get into analysis paralysis. Failing fast is about just doing a thing and trying it out and seeing if this is for you. There's lots of low calorie ways to do this. If you don't want to go to school, take a class on Coursera or EDX or ED, no, Coursera or Udemy on, you know, technology, if that's something that's of interest to you or, you know, on entrepreneurship, there's LinkedIn learning, there's lots of online resources for you to explore and be like, yeah, this is super cool. Or like, no, this was awful. I don't like this, right? Getting towards that direction of I like this and doing more of the things that you like that will lead to, that could lead to a career and being that lifelong learner are like, you know, super key, right? And then of course the network, the network, the network, you know, any opportunity you get to servant leadership through being a cha being part of a chamber, volunteering, growing your own little group within a group to study a thing, super valuable ways to connect and test out new things. So I will say that I love technology and I wake up every day and I just love it. So you, you have to be passionate at what you want and you also have to be honest with your employer. If you're not happy, there's other things that are in place there. So I always try to be true and upfront, but you have to be passionate and you know, want to get up every day and continue that job. All right, I guess I'm the last one. So I, I kind of want to piggyback on that. I think you have to find something that you love so that that passion can drive you every day um, and really find that lifelong career or journey. And you may not find it initially, but you'll find it on that path um, really that's going to help you grow, that's going to motivate you. Um, we spend a lot of time doing our work and doing our jobs. Oftentimes we spend more time there than we do with our own family. So there really has to be um, a sense of passion that comes from that, that really motivates you. I also encourage you, as you do look into different programs, look at different internships that are available when you are going to take a job somewhere. Um, really work with the benefits person to see if they have have tuition reimbursement, how career advancement can work, and always be willing to be tapped on the shoulder and raise your hand, I think, for those additional opportunities, because those are going to be the real sweet spot um, where you're able to grow, and you may learn that you like something else within that field. So um, I think the sky's the limit, and it's just an exciting time, and I think particularly in Broward County, we have so many resources and so many connections in the community um, that, you know, there's endless possibilities where you can be involved. So I think we're really fortunate to be in Broward County with all the different resources we have. Yeah, and I wanted to say also to our listeners, especially those who are still in school, you have uh, school guidance counselors that you can rely on, you have your principal, you have your teachers, all of those folks uh, have great resources at their disposal and can bring them to you. Uh, I want to know if our, our, our guests have any questions. Do you have any questions? I can bring the mic over to you. Oh, she's got a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for all of that wonderful, wonderful information. So my question was, um, what opportunities you guys have and what's the criteria? So we went over the internships, um, the apprenticeships. How do we get information on that program and could you share with us what the criteria is? Thank you. So, so I can, if I can get my microphone. Out. So I can speak um, for Broward Health. So everything for our internship program is actually on our website. Um, so the summer internship program actually starts um, on next week uh, in May after Memorial Day and runs through August each year. So those applications are typically due anywhere from January to March. And it'll tell you the criteria. So we have people that are in college. There's different tiers of the internship program because it is a paid internship program, but all that information's there. There's also information on the website for volunteers that can come anytime. So when you fill out the volunteer application, you can be in high school, you don't have to be a college student, and you can kind of um, write down any area of interest you might have, or maybe you don't know which area you want to be in, and we can bring you into the hospital, expose you to a couple different areas, and then you can kind of 
understand where you would want to volunteer. So all of that information is available on our website if you need it. I will also say that I've been an a, a active uh, sponsor of Talent Forge. Uh, if so if you are a, if you are a, a current uh, Broward County Public Schools uh, uh, um, student, Talent Forge is there. Career Source Broward has summer programs that are out there. They have apprenticeship type programs that are there. So there's definitely a lot of resources. And try, I will say that for Talent Forge, we had IT help desk during pandemic. We had remote marketers that were out there. We, you know, again, like everyone here, it's not just healthcare. It's not just IT. It's not just manufacturing. So in general, there's a lot of resources that are in place there, and they're all online. It's never too late. So um, Microsoft has, they usually in, hire interns for the summer, but interns are usually master's degree students, and they have to be returning to school the last semester, at least. There is an apprenticeship program, but it varies by city, and depending on uh, what they're doing in the community. A lot of these things can be found, I think, at careers.microsoft.com. So beyond that, uh, looking for internship opportunities that are available locally, like I, I mentioned before, hackathons are usually sponsored by corporations. So usually they will send recruiters to be part of the hackathons at the, at the schools, at the colleges and universities, at the high schools. So that's also a great, you know, going to hackathon to participate and also to network and, and connect with employers in the area is another way to find out, you know, what internship opportunities are available locally or with other companies in, in one place. One last resource is Bridge to Life. I gotta give a shout out to Colleen and the group that are out there. We've used, we've used resources from them also. So Bridge to Life. Uh, ABC Institute College is available for trades, and they have different programs. They have a pre-apprenticeship pre, pre program, and they can also connect you with local contractors that are looking to start somebody who, who is just getting into the entry level as well. Well, Heather, Rudy, Michael, and Denise, I want to thank you on behalf of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce for all of your great advice, your great information, your experiences, strength, and hope. Thank you so much for all of that. And I want to tell the viewers that this was brought to you by our Education and Workforce Council and its chairman, Tobin Slavin. That's it for now. Look forward to seeing you next year. We're off. Now you can ask. <laughs> <laughs> to the gentleman, the um, grade blazer. I mean, blazer blazer. Uh, I'd like to ask. So you're in the tile industry, correct? Yes. All right. Um, so I'm more of like a hands-on kind of guy. I'm not really into like. I mean, of course, I just have to. I understand that you just have to adaptability to you know, work around the how things are changing. So, but I also like getting working with my hands. So it's like in your field, or rather just construction in general. Is it a type of situation where, um, how would I put it? You're locked in and you're just in a, in a position where it's like, you're sometimes you're doing this, sometimes you're doing that, or is it where you're in one thing, you specialize in that, and you can just move around and do many different things if you just choose to? Yes. So as an example, I was a tile contractor when I was growing up. Then I went into warehouse operations. So I worked for a, a, an organization that, that had the distribution center. So I learned warehousing. Then I came into the office uh, when, they, when they couldn't find office staff because I knew the product. I was able to learn at the time was um, Peachtree, which is what the uh, QuickBooks. The QuickBooks at the time, I installed that software. So I was more... Uh, I was hands-on, but I also saw that I was able to go into, do the office work. So there, if you're in construction and you can do hands-on, that's great. Learn that. And then if you, are, if you find yourself that you want to go into another area in the construction, it's just learning that, you know, asking, you know, putting it out there, saying, I want to learn that other area. And, uh, for example, if you, if you go into electrical, you can also probably, you know, move to HVAC, which is air conditioning. So, 
you know, you can move around. I mean, as a tile contractor, I did a lot of residential work. I learned a little bit of electrical, a little bit of plumbing, but I didn't do that per se. So you can, if you're hands-on, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. That's very demanding right now. Like marine, like in the marine, if you're electrical and marine, you're making a lot more money than if just electrical, just in general. Because it's a niche. Right, because it's a niche and it's in, it's, in, it's in high demand. A welder, but now you put welder in the marine yeah. side, yeah. you're making a lot more. You know, like I said earlier, like a lineman for like, you know, Mastec, uh, they're looking for linemen. They have in, 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 a, in the apprenticeship program that we have at the ABC, they have about 100 guys right now on, that they have as, as an apprentice. And the linemen go in making a lot of money because, you know, they're, they're doing that work that, you know, like the FPL trucks that go down and go up the, the, the telephone poles. Yeah. No, you're welcome. Yeah, that was a good question, though. Yep. Yeah, it was. Very good question. Thank you, guys. <laughs> it's a wrap. That's it. <laughs>